Welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Middle East News Hour. And once again, I'm pleased to be joined this week uh, by my colleague from the Center for Security Policy and my very good friend, Dr. David Wormser, reporting to you from, from Maryland, correct? Yes, that's right. Okay, so we're transatlantic again. And um, we're going to talk. We're, we're going to talk this week about a bunch of stuff. One of the things we're going to start with right now is the elections yesterday in the United States. We're, we're recording on Wednesday. And so Tuesday's election in the United States uh, that saw pretty significant Republican victories on the on the state and local levels in Virginia. I don't know that we still have the final results from New Jersey, but they certainly did very well there in New York, uh, in Pennsylvania, in Minnesota, uh, in Georgia. So these are some very significant, uh, largely swing and often, uh, as in the case with Minnesota, deeply Democratic states that uh, Republicans were able to win statewide offices in uh, Virginia. They swept the statewide offices for the first time since 2009. And in other states, you had similar uh, outcomes. And so uh, I I think this move or these elections were a watershed event for the very uh, young Biden administration. Um, what do you think, David? Well, I fully agree. I, I think when you look at the actual results, uh, we're talking about there's a lot of nothing. This hasn't happened since then type uh, type of episodes, whether it's uh, the uh, Rochester, New Hampshire's mayor, which is the first time in decades a Democrat has lost, to uh, to Minnesota and the defeat of Ilhan Omar's uh, uh, initiative to defund the police. I think one of the things that is generally missed internationally is the school board elections. Uh, these school boards have been elected across the country, and this year had many of them. And virtually universally, every school board election turned out a huge defeat for the Democrats or for the liberals or for progressives, the left as a whole, Uh, whether it is the school board in Denver, which is no bastion of right wing extremism, or whether it's school boards in South Texas uh, or school boards in, uh, in Virginia and so forth. So you're seeing from the absolute most local level all the way up to the statewide Uh, gubernatorial level, you're seeing uh, an unprecedented uh, wave to the right. Literally almost everywhere, the more conservative candidate won. If it was uh, Buffalo, Buffalo, uh, where you had the progressive running against a Democrat who was defeated in the primaries and had to run as an independent in a write-in campaign. Yeah, that's the the craziest thing. Yeah, the write-in campaign campaign won. Won, exactly. So literally the, the, the candidate in every single election that was to the right um, won. Uh, and, and, and I think that's a, that's a very clear signal of something very serious happening in America right now. There is a backlash emerging against the radical agenda that this nation feels it's been subjected to. You know what's interesting to me, and, and we see it in Israel as well, that when the left is in power, you don't get, I mean, you did in earlier times, like with Clinton and the triangulation uh, strategy that he adopted uh, after his first loss, I think in the midterms in 94. Um, but in in the United States, you don't you 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 had a coalition of progressives and moderate Dems, uh, generally you know suburban uh, parents, who joined together and they were the coalition that won the White House and that won both houses of Congress last year in the 2020 elections. And you see with this, particularly like what you said, you know most most amazingly with the school board elections, things that actually affect the lives of American families, uh, but also in the elections for the Supreme Court in Pennsylvania and the district's attorney in uh, Long Island and in Nassau County in New York and in other places, you have clean sweeps of Republicans. So where you had, whether it's criminal justice, law enforcement issues, or whether it's the issues of uh, transgender bathrooms and um, and uh, the kind of sort of pornography that they've been teaching in the classroom, uh, in in states like Virginia, um, all of these things had a backlash. But what I find most remarkable is that in all of these places, you know, 
the progressives get to determine policy when they're in charge, when the Democrats are in charge, even though the moderate Democrats are arguably a larger number of people. So that, you know, you have the Ilhan Omars of uh, the Democrat Party, the Rashida Tlaib, and all of the rest of them, all of the rest of the radicals, they're the ones that are pushing the policy train in Congress. You have all of the progressives and the Democrat in, in the Biden White House that are, are the ones that are dictating policies, even though um, the moderates are, are a larger number of people. And you're right, there's this backlash. But to me, what's amazing is how the progressives just seize the driver's seat from the very beginning and and seize the wheel and 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 just started driving the bus off a, off of the cultural marxist cliff i think that there's a something very dangerous going on for the democratic party which is on one side the election in 2020 on the national level, I mean 2016, excuse me, on the national level that is the election that brought President Trump to power. What you saw there was a lackluster performance in the inner cities uh, and in some of the core Democratic districts. It didn't, it wasn't that they turned Republican, they just didn't show up. So on one side, the Democratic Party now is entirely reliant on energy from its most ideologically fervent core to show up. Mm -hmm. And they felt disenfranchised. They didn't show up and they cost Hillary Clinton the election. So on one side, the Democratic Party has to has to empower that that wing of the party. On the other side, the only way they could take over was wing, winning in swing districts. Uh, and, and, and turning independence. In other words, they weren't going to win through the city. They were going to lose through this, not having the cities vote for them, but they weren't going to win through the city. So they had to turn to at least having an aura or a, a, a veneer of being a party that is really the old liberal, hardcore liberal, patriotic American uh, Democratic Party. The problem with that is that now that make that wedding, it cannot, is not sustainable. Uh, you can't continue to energize the cities or uh, it's not really the cities. You can't really energize the progressive base, which is where the real energy of the party is and, and, and still wear a moderate face. And it's and it's coming to a head. And I think Biden's coalition is reaching a breaking point now. And you'll see it over this this Build Back Better program, the budget. Uh, some moderate Democrats are not going to join in anymore because they know they're going to lose the elections that they have, whether it's Manchin or Cinema in Arizona and, uh, and uh, West Virginia or some of these swing dr districts in the House. Uh, they're terrified right now. They know that the progressive agenda is toxic. So they're running from it. And that will stall the agenda. On the other side, when you read the reactions by the left, uh, their reaction is, well, <laughs> just proves America's racist. Uh, and number one and number two, it's because these darn moderates weren't moving fast enough. So just double down, go faster. So I, I think what you're going to see now. And again, I think this goes to the undemocratic nature of the left. They only so much care about winning elections. They really care about power. And right now they still have power for another two years. They have their hands on institutions and they certainly beyond the government have tremendous power, whether it's Hollywood or the mainstream media. So I think what you're going to see is a tremendous doubling down on the ideology by that crowd uh, in an effort to radically transform the country so that it's irreversible in two years, because now they're beginning to think they may not be able to stay in power. But again, they only care about elections so much. They care much more about their ideology. Whereas the moderates, you know, the mansions and the cinemas, they care about being reelected. So you're going to see a fissure. It's going to get ugly. And I would not rule out, you know, we did see, I, I take us back for a moment to 2020. We had a summer of riots and burning and looting. Uh, and then on the eve of elections in, the, in 2020, the one where Biden was elected, what you saw was a real tangible threat of an insurrection, a genuine insurrection by the left uh, against the elections. Did it not go their way? There was mobilization. People were terrified. The left openly said they will revolt. 
So, and, and have an insurrection. So I think that was put on hold. I don't think the threat of that is gone. So again, the left, the progressive left only cares about elections so much. And you know, I mean, they want, they turn to violence. What, what you're right. But I mean, there's also the other thing, which I find that really the danger is that they know they're running scared or they even are going to make their peace with the fact that a year from now, they're going to lose control of both houses of Congress. And uh, and come January 2023, when the new Congress is is, uh, is sworn in, they're not going to have uh, e- even a slim majority in either house. I think that the Georgia elections um, where Republicans won some key offices in that state, I think that you're going to see uh, there as well uh, 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 the um, the uh, um, Republican who's running now, uh, what's his name, the former football player, uh, he's oh, yeah. Herschel Walker, he's going to win. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that, uh, I think that the Republicans are going to take control of both houses at any rate. Michigan's also in trouble. A lot of them are, I mean, now a lot of them are now Maryland, uh, uh, Democrats are, are in trouble in the Senate as well. Um, but I, I think, uh, I think, I think the point is that your point is very well taken that they're going to try to enact every radical policy that they possibly can in the next year whether through regulation or through legislation. Um, and then you're going to be stuck with a situation like we had with Obamacare, right? Where uh, Americans so opposed Obamacare that you had uh, the opening, the uh, Senate opening for Teddy Kennedy's seat in 2009, uh, taken by uh, by a Republican upstart in what was a, uh, a stunning electoral turn because uh, because Americans wanted to block uh, Obamacare at all costs. He he raised a million dollars was uh, in one day. I can't remember his name uh, for some reason, but but all that meant was that Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats decided to just accept the Senate bill that had already passed, and they passed through Obamacare after the American people had already said, absolutely not, we don't want this. And then it became done. And then it was a fait accompli. The Supreme Court was afraid to overturn it. Roberts was afraid to overturn it, even though it was clearly unconstitutional. And it became it just became the law of the land that everybody has to accept now. And America really has been fundamentally transformed uh, by Obamacare. And it worked. Uh, you had the same thing happen with the Iranian nuclear deal in 2015, right? I mean, that that they uh, that they pushed this through. Without the support of the Senate, they scared enough moderate Republicans into agreeing not to treat it as a treaty so that they were able to ram it through, even though the majority of senators opposed it. Um, and and then uh, and then America has sort of been stuck with this, even after Donald Trump left, the, the, the Democrats refused to let go of it. Uh, and now we're seeing that the, the Biden administration is pushing America's way back into some treaty that or some agreement that is completely insane and that gives Iran a glide path to a nuclear arsenal. So you're right. I mean, I think that they can do a lot of damage in the next year, both domestically and internationally. Um, And that really, I think, brings us to. um, But at the same time, they are probably going to lose power uh, next year in a real formal sense. But I think we should move, if if you don't mind, uh, to how the weakness of the Biden administration domestically and also the radicalism of their foreign policy agenda uh, impacted what we saw in Glasgow this this week at the UN at the UN climate conference and and what you make of what happened there and and uh, how we're supposed to look at at uh, China and the United States uh, in light of um, uh, uh, what happened there. You well, I, you know, I mean, it, it was it was truly a, a, a phenomenon that we sent half our cabinet right. to this this uh, festival. Uh, you know, it was like a festival of chipmunks, basically that that all yapped away about what great things they're going to do. It was a great virtue signaling summit, and 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 uh, and and yet there were China and Russia, which basically said we're not playing. We're serious countries. And we're, seri- we're seriously going to pursue our interests as they define it. Uh, so what you're seeing is tangibly the decline of America as a relevant power. 
uh, and it's making, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's kind of making a fool of itself by, by, by acting the way it is. It, it isn't acting like a great power. What worries me is with the election loss, foreign policy is one of the areas where this administration, as well as the progressives, think they have no resistance, even after losing the House or Senate in 2022. They, this is where they can enact their most radical agenda without resistance, because foreign policy is the pur purview of, of, the, of the White House. And the second thing is the extreme American weakness now out there uh, it means that the eagerness by which Biden will have to somehow co-opt really bad ideas in Europe and try to try to pay homage to them to maintain an image of currency and power, even though there is none, or even turning to Russia or China to try to come up with agreements, even if they're virtual surrenders, in order to portray the image of a diplomatically robust uh, and still relevant the United States, combined with the radical agenda from, from the progressives here, I think could create a very toxic foreign policy environment in the United States and ex externally. Um, so I would, now you mean that they're just going to make incredibly stupid decisions that are going to endanger the United States or toxic? Correct. Uh, correct. That, that endanger the United States, sell out our allies in a great way, uh, and fundamentally rewrite the rules of international interaction that could damage the United States. One thing I would look at is the use of, you know, in Davos, you have Klaus Schwab and this whole global reset culture that you see these elites gathering, none of which have been elected and really have any public following. Uh, they're working to try to create these institutions that rewrite the rules of things like financial international transactions and lending and so forth. At the beginning, it's just gingerly about the environment, but it's going to take a much greater and more vast dimension very soon. So I think what you're gonna see is the use of international agreements to essentially legislate uh, a fundamental change of the global economy and American economy. Yeah. The question is, without ever passing through Congress. Yeah, but the question is, um, how serious are these? I mean, I saw this article in, in Politico today that was written by their climate change correspondent. So you figure he's on board with all of this. And he was um, he was representing what happened in in Scotland as sort of a, a cultic ritual that had no relationship to the real world, that even the UN Secretary General acknowledged that A, the pledges for reduced carbon emissions were gonna be insufficient to impact global temperatures, and B, none of them were gonna keep their word anyway, that it's more like this uh, ritual of, of, um, of, uh, of public confessions uh, to witchcraft or something like that, that people go, and they acknowledge their sins and they ask for forgiveness from uh, the, their former colonies or whatever for polluting the world. I think uh, uh, Boris Johnson said something about, uh, it's not fair, we were, we've been polluting the world for the past 250 years and now you have to deal with the consequences of our imperial misdeeds. I mean, it was all kind of nonsense, but you know, I mean, nobody is is going to starve their countries of fossil fuels and completely destroy their economies. Or at any way, it's hard to imagine that they will. And if governments like this form and are and are pushing forward with these kinds of things, just as in the United States, we saw yesterday, there will be course corrections and they'll be voted out of office at a certain point unless they seize power and cease to be dem democracies, which is possible. But but. You know, Klaus Schwab and the whole Davos crowd, they certainly uh, have tried to introduce new norms to international affairs. But in a way, you can take heart from Putin and from uh, and from uh, the Chinese that just boycotted this nonsense and said, forget it. You know, we're not part of this game. And even, you know, and, and at the end of the day, even if they didn't want to acknowledge it, everybody knew that without China there, the entire exercise was stupid because you have the largest emitter of carbons in the world boycotting the conference that's supposed to limit carbon emissions. So what are you even talking about? I, I mean, the question is, when you're putting together these fantasy-based rules that 
that real powers that cut that real world powers that have real powers are just ignoring and you live in democracies why should we be too worried about any of this because you'll get a Donald Trump or somebody else who's just going to say to hell with it this wasn't ratified by the senate and we're leaving the paris treaty and we're leaving davos and we I mean he didn't even go to davos and you know we're not having anything to do with this nonsense because that's not where the danger is. I, I think that, as you said, the summit was a virtue signaling festival. That's not where the problem is. The problem lies in some of the subtle regulatory efforts that this administration, and frankly, there were a few uh, bureaucratic efforts that I'm not even sure the Trump administration paid attention to under the Trump administration in its last half year that were very dangerous. For example, uh, we with our Federal uh, Reserve, which is our central bank, essentially, ha- joined uh, uh, an organization or joined the international organization of central banks. Uh, there was a certain uh, structure that was set up. This is under Klaus and uh, Klaus Schwab's initiative, but it wasn't this public fanfare that was negotiated out or Paris uh, agreement or anything like that or climate accord or Kyoto. It wasn't, it wasn't something such an easily visible target. What it was is they subtly changed the regulatory rules on lending to increase uh, the uh, factoring in of environment into political, into the risk calculations of lending. And that way they could change the fundamental fiduciary capabilities of a bank to act. Namely, any investor, a bank included lending and so forth, is required to operate under certain monetary guidelines, fiduciary guidelines uh, that, that, that are very, very strict. You can't just decide to use the money to go off and do something pie in the sky for the environment when your investors didn't believe it. What these regulations do is actually build in to the idea of risk, the environmental cost, according to who? These, the, 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 the Davos crowd. But we're now committed to that. That didn't require any. But that's a regulation. It's not legislation. So again, I mean, if. No, but if- we're now part of it. And the banks have to now accord to it. So the banks are changing the way they look at lending. Now, this is this is for environment. And it makes, uh, for example, loans for a new, let's say. Wait, some, I, don't, uh, I, I don't want to get too too deep into the weeds here, but just so I understand, America joined an international banking organization. Can it just leave? I mean, what would be the importance yeah, of this leaving? Entangle, this entangle now would mean that we'd be cut off from the international lending structures. And that's that's our industries are, you know, let's say we have a business that does this. Right now it's environment. I'm sure that social justice will be factored in soon too. So let's say a business wants to loan money to an Israeli startup. He can't. Unless it's it's fat, it, it'll be right now he he can, but it'll be this risk will be factored in and he will decide he can't. Now we can leave that, but the problem is to go to the international structures then to to for Israel or anybody else to get a loan will be impossible. So I, I think that it's much more nefarious, subtle, and unseen than one thinks. And it doesn't, we don't get the the uh, the satisfaction of having it pass through. Our, our legislative branch so that we can't target it and have a public debate. The whole point of all this was that there will be no public debate. This is a very European Union way of in the middle of the night, fundamentally and radically transforming society without anybody having a democratic voice over it. And I think that it already began under the Trump administration when they quietly, the bureaucracy started agreeing to these things without really, I think, the administration knowing it. And this certainly will continue. And I think that's the problem the Republicans would have if they took over. How do you undo that? First of all, you can't unless you control the White House. The second thing is the White House then would have to have a determination to go with a fine tooth comb through these thousands and thousands of regulatory structures to try to figure out where and what's been done and then undo it, which would require a huge political cadre of political appointees and a lot of attention, knowledge, essentially a tremendous amount of forensic work by a future administration to undo. And then there would be huge costs to that. 
because all of a sudden our banks and our industries would face tr tremendous problems operating outside our borders. So it's not so easily reversible. And I, I, to me, that's one of the most dangerous things right now that this administration is undertaking. It's not so visible. Well, you know, I, I think that um, one of the things that we're seeing with the Republicans, and we're certainly seeing it with the Likud and the right-wing bloc here in Israel, um, and, and I don't know, where we go from here, really, but there is a, a large scale rejection of what have long been called moderates, right? And and then uh, derisively have become known as rhinos in the United States and and fake right wingers in Israel, like uh, Naftali Bennett and his party and Gidon Saar and his party and Avigdor Lieberman and his party, which are all ostensibly right wing parties, but they've facilitated the seizure of power by the radical left and by the Muslim Brotherhood in the current government. So, um, you know, you, you see a wide scale rejection of them as a part of the Israeli right. You see a growing and already significant rejection of moderate Republicans on the part of the Republican base. Uh, it's sort of a mirror image of what's happening on the Democrat side, which is that once the radicals took over uh, the policy making of the Democratic Party, um, you know, they're they're squeezing out the centrists, and that's happening on the Republican side too, and so uh, and in Israel as well. And so maybe um, the very fact that people understand that this is really a war for the survival of our societies or their transformation into cultural Marxist post nationalist societies is going to uh, enable. Um, uh, future successor governments in Israel and in, and in the United States to either take a fine tooth comb, as you said, and do all of the forensic examinations of everything that they've done and undo them and be willing to pay the political cost of doing so domestically and internationally. Um, I mean, I think the chance of that happening increases but I, 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 I mean, there, you're absolutely correct that what's happening in so many places in, in the free world today is that you have these unelected, uh, you have these unelected radicals on the left that are using the power of the state, of the bureaucracy, of the courts, of the uh, law enforcement uh, systems in order to seize power from politicians and to reduce the civil liberties and freedoms of citizens who who oppose their agenda so i think i think you're right and and we are facing an uphill battle there's no question about it because when one side refuses to accept defeat and continues fighting and relitigating battles that they have lost and they don't let go until you give up uh, and the other party is willing to accept defeat and move on um you you don't you don't have a you don't have a you don't have an even playing field, and, and um... I think that that's one of the things you could see maybe subtly coming out of this election. Until now, this has been a political fight for the right, for the center, even for the moderate left, the old school liberals, the Hubert Humphrey crowd, and the, those Democrats who still think the Democratic Party is the legacy of that. They all considered this all politically, then it's a political battle. The left, the progressive left, does not see it as a political battle. They see it as a battle. Politics is only the means. It's they are they are after a radical agenda that they realize involves real power and real suspension ultimately of the freedoms that we value. So they're not after just politics and winning a debate. They are they are they are after something much more serious. And I think what you're beginning to see with the school board issue and the moms that, that revolted, suburban moms, no right wing conspiracy, is the country's beginning to wake up to the idea that they are truly in a battle now, a real culture war with, with the progressive left. And I think even the moderate Democrats are beginning to realize and are horrified the question is, I don't think they have the power to do anything about it anymore, not without reaching out across the aisle. And instead of trying to use and leverage and ride the progressives politically to defeat the right, they're going to have to sw take a deep swallow and say, listen, we're, this country's in trouble. We're willing to suspend to some extent our political interests if you work with us 
and you and you use uh, this moment to try to defeat the progressives. So I do think that there's the possibility of a broader coalition emerging to defeat the progressives. But I think it's in the context emerging universally on the right and even in the center that we're in much more of a serious battle. It's not a political battle. It is more than that now. It is a genuine cultural war that the progressive left is waging on the United States, and and it's an attempt to destroy it. Uh, And that that people's backs are indeed now beginning to that feeling that they're against the wall. So that is a climate, though, of instability. So I, I think the United States... Do not look for the United States to be a stable, calm place for the next few years. No, I I think you're right. And I think, you know, we talked about something about this, I think, last week or the week before, maybe every week. I don't know. But that, um, you know, Israel has a real problem with its and Israel isn't alone with its with its alliance with the United States, because it's an alliance now increasingly only with the Republicans. And um, that means that. you know, we there is no long term policy that we can adopt together with the United States, because the minute that the administration flips from one side to the other. So the the policies are completely reversed. I mean, we saw that uh, we saw that in Glasgow with the Paris Treaty that uh, that Trump backed out of and um, and Joe Biden running to all of the all of the all of the world leaders that were there with and and uh, and insulting him and marginalizing him and all he could do was apologize for for the the sins of his predecessor Trump for leaving the Paris Treaty and they were all laughing at him. Um, I mean, because the absurdity, of course, not that it matters, but is that the Trump administration reduced carbon emissions by twenty percent while not in the Paris Treaty. Uh, but but be that as it may, I mean, I think. You know, Israel is also uh, we've left the realm of reality based foreign policies. We saw it. Uh, I thought it was it was rather embarrassing. We had the second largest delegation to Glasgow only after, you know, second only to the United States. We had one hundred and forty members of this delegation of Israelis. And it, it begins with the absurdity of uh, of Naftali Bennett announcing that Israel is going to reduce carbon emissions to zero by 2050, when even if we do that, uh, we won't make any imp- impact whatsoever on global temperatures because we're a speck on on the globe. Uh, n- it doesn't make any difference. We could be, you know, emitting more carbon, pumping all of our energy out of dirty coal uh, stacks, and it it wouldn't make any difference to anybody because we're too small. But we would tank our economy, and so. It's, you say it's all virtue signaling. Unfortunately, I think that these people might actually go forward and do it because they're convinced well, that uh, uh, that this is somehow or another going to. They can try. I, I mean, but, you know, I think this this zero carbon emissions is a good example. You could sit there and say, well, we want to get away from combustion engines. Right. You want to do that. You can do that. It's probably feasible in 20 years. But when you say zero carbon emissions, it means you're also getting rid of natural gas. And I think any serious environmental program sees natural gas as a considerable and and medium term, not just short patch term, but medium term uh, bridge to a more energy and green future, uh, green energy future, as other technologies are developed and so forth. It still may take 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years. So it really, once you see somebody like Biden get up there and declare against methane gas and uh, Israel committing to zero hydrocarbon emissions, this is not serious. The only consequence of that is if any policies are adopted that actually move in that direction is uh, there won't be any power. So you'll have wonderful electric cars uh, and you'll have great cell phones and Israel will be at the cutting edge of both. The electric cars will be sitting dead because there'll be no electricity to fill them. And you can't even call your friends to complain because your phone will be dead because there will be you know, no, no electricity to fill your phone if even you don't. And by the way, you're going to need raw materials for that. It's going to involve mining, which is another great thing the green movement is not taking seriously. How are they going to store energy if they're not if they're not produ- 
if they want to live off of uh, five hours of sunlight in Norway and have solar panels and, and wind, that's great. But how do you store energy? You need batteries. Batteries need raw materials. Raw yeah. materials means you need to mine, and they don't want to mine. So, you know, I mean, there's a certain point where realism has to set in, and this virtue signaling will either be uh, compromised quite significantly, or you're really going to be back in the Stone Age in a lot of Western countries. You know, China, I don't know Russia anything. love this, though. I mean, they're willing to watch us self emolate they yeah, love I, it. I don't know. I mean, that's really one of the great dangers of, of the progressives is that it's, you know, all evidence uh, indicates that at no point will they be willing to acknowledge reality. I mean, I look at Virginia, for instance, and it's true that there was a massive shift in that state uh, uh, over the past year. And it was largely redoubted to the radicalization of the education system and the school boards and the curriculums that they're teaching children and the backlash from parents. But I mean, um, uh, the Democrat uh, McAuliffe, he got 48 percent of the vote or 49 percent of the vote. And he did it while supporting curriculum and supporting policies that enable the rape of girls in school bathrooms by boys wearing skirts and and then cover for the boys because they want to they want to protect uh, so-called transgender rights to go to girls bathrooms and and rape them and they have pedophilic materials that are being taught to adolescent children in the classroom as if it's literature you know this is not Huck Finn right and and, and Huck Finn, of course, you're not allowed to study because Huckleberry Finn was a racist. So, um, you know, you, you have these absolute absurdities and with all due respect, and it's and and they still got 48, 49 percent of Virginians thinking that that was OK. And I mean, I, I just don't see any willingness on the part of of hardcore progressives, and they are dictating so many policies today in the United States. And if it's not on the federal level, then it's in all of academia. And they're insane. And well, their policies I mean, are anti-human, you know. I think it gives you a clue to what they're really after. I mean, we can sit there and talk about the green agenda and how they're really in the end going to just tank the green agenda with this, or you can talk about taking control of the education structure in the end, they're going to tank that. It's true, they're going to lead to vast destruction. But I think this is where you need to get into what is the progressive soul. The progressive soul starts with anarchism, which is an attempt to destroy everything so that you can create a tabula rasa, a complete clean slate to radically transform mankind. Right. So they, you know, they are willing to allow Israel or America or Europe to go dark 12 hours a day, to have our economy fall apart, have people starve. This is all part of the uh, destruction, essentially, of the West that is really, really the objective here at first. It's the destruction of the West and all these means of green energy and, and so forth. This is all just, I think, the mechanism through which they hope to do it and legitimize it. But the real issue is to destroy the foundations of the West, lay it prostate, and then reinvent humankind. It's a very revolutionary, radical ideology that is truly, you know, truly in the spirit of the Russian anarchists of the late 1800s that Dostoevsky and others so brilliantly described. Yeah, and what's funny, of course, is that while this is happening in the West, the the, the Russians look relatively yeah. humane and and responsible and like adults. I mean, it's very hard uh, to, to watch uh, Putin versus Biden and think that the good guy here the person who's on the side of normal people is the president of Russia, who's a autocratic murderer, who, you know, who 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 is who has done all kinds of horrible things since he took power 21 years ago. And yet he he's not he he's not he's not subscribing to these inhuman positions and policies that are being enthusiastically and, and uh, advanced by the Biden administration and, and really in a sort of totalitarian way against parents, against family. Now, I mean, they've already killed God. 
and they're watching and sitting back and watching the West uh, uh, commit suicide under these circumstances. But, you know, it's very interesting. The left here, the moderate left, uh, they keep looking at Putin as a communist who didn't get the memo that communism was dead. And I don't think they understand how, how serious this man is and how many of the ills he's driving Russian policy through, namely the ills he points into to in the West, that he is basing the confidence of Russian culture and strategy on are real. And the West isn't taking seriously what he's saying. I think it's hard for me. I'm a, you know, the son of a Czech dissident who fled in 1948 from Czechoslovakia and with the KGB on her tail. To admit that Russia actually is onto something here is, is, is horrifying for me, but it, realistically speaking, they're seeing things in the West that 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 uh, they're they're providing in their own concepts somewhat of an antidote to and and but at the same time they and China are sitting back and saying well great you know you want to kill yourself you just make our lives a lot easier doing that so uh, I, I find it terrifying right now to watch well why don't we take a step uh, away from the the sort of meta problem which is the which is the West's uh, overall uh, suicide attempt that that is unfolding today with the progressives and with you know far leftists, communists, social democrats, whatever you want to call them, cultural Marxists uh, in in the United States and Europe and uh, to a significant degree in Israel as well. And and let's just uh, move for a second to a specific issue, which is the Palestinians, because. Um, We've had uh, some incredibly uh, significant Israeli concessions being made to the Palestinians over the past several weeks by this government. Um, I think the most important one came last week. Uh, I mean, I'll just uh, run through the other two. One is that uh, Benny Gantz, the defense minister, started uh, uh, reinstated Israeli transfer of tax uh, revenues to the Palestinian Authority. And this is uh, against the the law in Israel because following the passage of the Taylor Force Act in the United States, which blocked the United States from funding the Palestinian Authority so long as they pay salaries to terrorists in prisons in Israeli jails and to the families of terrorists that were killed um, while carrying out their terrorist attacks or subsequent to them, um, Israel passed a law of its own, and that law said that Israel cannot transfer funds of any kind to the Palestinian Authority so long as they continue to do this. So what Benny Gantz did was, in order to restore funding, even though the Palestinian Authority continues to pay the salaries of terrorists and to their families as well, um, he decided to make a loan which was equal to the amount of money that Israel was supposed to transfer to the Palestinian Authority from taxes it had it had collected from them and or for them. And so um, everybody knew it was a lie that this loan would never be called and that he was just giving them money, even as they are directly funding terrorists and and he's breaking the law. So then he, he did that. And this past week, we discovered that Ram, which is the Muslim Brotherhood Party that uh, commands the government because its four seats give the government a uh, a majority in the Knesset and allow it to continue to function, that they have very close ties to Hamas and that they have been using their nonprofit organizations to funnel millions of shekels to Hamas in Gaza. Um, and in fact, um, my colleague Amnon Lord sent me uh, a New Yorker article that came out yesterday that said that um, Mansour Abbas, the head of this Muslim Brotherhood party in Israel, actually met with Hamas leader Khalid Mashal in Doha in 2013. And his people have met, his senior people in Ram have traveled to Gaza and met with and transferred money to senior Hamas officials. This came out last week. And now Ram has gained control through its membership in the governing coalition of all of the money that the that is being budgeted for the Arab sector, the Arab community in Israel, that's 53 billion shekels in the in the budget that's now being approved in the Knesset uh, as we speak. So this is enough money to completely transform Israel into an Islamic state. Essentially, it's enough money to 
make every single Arab in Israel beholden to the Islamic movement because they're the ones who control all the funding in Israel. And of course, it it enables the stability of the Hamas regime in Gaza because Israel won't dare take any action against Hamas because if they do, then the government will fall. So those are two things. And then the last thing that happened this week was, or last week, was that Benny Gantz, the defense minister, um, told there was a, in 20... In 2019, in the Jordanian law is in, is the law of the land in Judea and Samaria because Israel has not applied its own sovereignty to the areas. It's been governing it under uh, a military government. And Jordanian law uh, makes selling land to non-Muslims and specifically, of course, to Jews, a capital offense. And so in 1971, the military government in Judea and Samaria Uh, changed uh, the law um, by issuing a a military order updating the law, enabling the sale of land to companies owned by Jews, but stipulated that these sales to companies that were not owned by Muslims had to be registered with a civil administration. So in recent years, uh, the Palestinian Authority has... uh, gain control of the official in the civil administration, who is a Palestinian also. Uh, They they kidnapped him, they held him hostage for a few months, they tortured him and he came out and had agreed to uh, serve the Palestinian Authority as sort of a double agent in the civil administration. So he gets all of the registry of properties of land sales from Palestinians to Israeli corporations and then he tells the Palestinian Authority the name of the Palestinian land sellers who sell the land to these Israeli entities and they are all murdered. So when this phenomenon became widespread, the military advisor in the military government and in the defense ministry, both of them came to the conclusion that the time had come to update the law and enable uh, private sales of land from Arabs to or from Muslims to non-Muslims, meaning allowing private Israeli citizens, Jews, to buy land and private sales from Arabs, and that those transactions don't have to be registered with the civil administration in order to be uh, placed in force. So that was a way, obviously, to solve this very dangerous situation where anybody who dared to sell land to Israelis was murdered. Um, That was in 2019. And then Benny Gantz took hold of the defense ministry and it was held up. So these these, uh, NGOs that uh, support Israeli communities in Judea and Samaria petitioned the Supreme Court and demanded that the, the, uh, the determinations of the legal advisors of the military government and of the defense ministry be placed in force and that the law be updated. Benny Gantz came to the Supreme Court last week and he said, I've decided to rescind the recommendations. He was angry that they had ever been made public. They were supposed to be secret. And he said that the reason why he was going to bar Jews from buying land from Arabs in Judea and Samaria is because allowing Jews to do that would uh, probably cause a lot of Arabs to sell land to Jews. And that would make the Palestinians angry and that would make the international community angry. And so in the interest of making the international community happy and making the Palestinians happy, uh, he was going to bar Jews from buying land. And you know, from an Israeli perspective, the thing that's most problematic about this, I mean, everything is, I mean, but one of the things is that the foundation of Zionism is, uh, what's called the redemption of the land, is the purchase of land in the land of Israel by Jews for the purpose of Jewish settlement. That's the that's the sine qua non of, of Zionism. And here is the defense minister of the government of Israel barring Jews from buying land in the land of Israel. So just on a very fundamental foundational level, this is a complete abrogation of Jewish nationalism by the man who's charged with defending the country against its enemies. Um, and uh, I, I, I just, uh, I mean, so in having said this, do you agree with me? <laughs> no, no, I, I'm fine. I, and, and for what? For what did he do it? I mean, to 
avoid getting the PLO angry. The PLO gets angry or the PA gets angry when it has a political reason to do so, usually in terms of its competition with, with uh, Hamas or the Islamic Jihad or others. There are internal Palestinian reasons that lead to escalation, anger and explosions. Look at the last war uh, a half year ago. You can find all the roots of that escalation early March late February with the uh, with the Palestinian internal political dynamics that had nothing to do with Israel uh, that eventually uh, led to this war against Israel. So his attempt to calm the Palestinians is a fool's errand. Uh, the second thing is in terms of uh, not getting international. Look, I mean, I don't think Israel should tweak the world just for the sake of it, but let's not fall into a galut mentality. Uh, this is not the, the, the Israeli and Jewish rights have a role and have to be maintained. Uh, you can't sit there and because you're afraid of a reaction to suspend fundamental Jewish rights. Uh, you could practically say one little sliver of terror, but but to universally blanket and say Jews just should not buy because it can make the, 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 the world angry. They're going to be angry any move Israel does on the West Bank. There's nothing you can do to come to terms with that because it's irrational. The world's obsession with the Palestinians, the world's determination to force the Jews to surrender Jerusalem, and the, and the, and the, and the absolute commitment of everybody to take the cradle of Jewish civilization and wrest it from Jewish control is not changing by, by, the, by these behaviors. It's there. The, the better way to deal with it, we've seen, is when Jews are actually asserting their rights and behaving with self-respect, they actually gain respect. And, and their allies in the West, like, like the evangel evangelists and, and more and more politicians in Europe and the United States, they actually see this as, a, as, a, as an honorable and, and respectable thing. And you gain more support that way. So the very attempt that Gantz is trying to do to curry favor with people who anyway will never give you favor is, is, is sort of the manifestation of the very Galut mentality that Israel's very creation was meant to erase. The, 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 it's, a, it's a defective part of the Jewish soul that still needs greater exorcism. You know, you're right. And, uh, but I think it's also, uh, uh, it's, it's so pathetic because, you know, just this week you had 200 members of uh, the Republican congressional delegation uh, signing a bill, I think, uh, banning uh, the, the the administration from opening up a consulate in Jerusalem for the Palestinians. And you had Senator Josh Hawley, another conservative Republican, placing a hold on the appointment of Tom Nides to be the U.S. ambassador to Israel because he's publicly stated support for opening a U.S. consulate to the Palestinians in, in Jerusalem. So the Republicans are continuing to try to use their power in, in Congress, even as a minority party, to block the administration from taking anti-Israel positions, from taking anti-Israel actions. And when Bennett came to Washington to meet with, with Biden in, in August, he refused to meet with Republicans because he didn't want to get Biden angry. He wanted to develop good relations with with the administration, and he thought that by not meeting with Israel's most powerful and strong supporters in the United States, he also didn't meet with evangelicals, he was going to curry favor with the White House that holds him and Israel in contempt and is deeply hostile to them. So I think, you know, the the Israeli uh, government, the, the, the Bennett, Lapid, uh, uh, Gantz, and, and, uh, and Mansour Abbas uh, Muslim Brotherhood government, I mean, I think that they are also undermining the supporters that Israel has in the United States by taking these kinds of actions that empower the people who are really opposed to Israel in the United States. I mean, why? And, I, and you know, it, it was interesting. Uh, Senator Cruz had an incredible speech on the Senate floor yesterday or the day before this week. Anyway, uh, like I said, we're taping on Wednesday the 3rd of November, and I think that the speech was either on Monday or Tuesday, the 1st or 2nd of November. 
And he devoted a, uh, the first third of his speech to the Muslim Brotherhood and, and, uh, and the ostensible administration support for the Muslim Brotherhood and how they're demanding the release of Muslim Brotherhood prisoners from Egyptian jail as a condition for the transfer of $130 million in USA to uh, Egypt. And, and um, you know, what would, what would Senator Cruz say if he recognized, if he realized that actually the Muslim Brotherhood through the Ram Party uh, essentially controls the Israeli government because the Israeli government is completely beholden to all of its demands. And if they're not met and Ram leaves the government, then there won't be a government and we'll go to a new elections. And therefore, they hold effective control over the Israeli government. I mean, I, I think it's really it's really distressing to see just how radical uh, things have become here. And I worry about the impact of that on Republican support for Israel in the long term. How do you think it's going to impact Republican support when you have this kind of radical, progressive Muslim Brotherhood government in Jerusalem? Well, I, you know, the, the less Israel shows self-respect, the less respect it commands abroad. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, be, everything begins with self-respect. If if Israel's acting as if it's scared of its own rights and it, it treads gingerly, then of course the others will treat those rights with less regard. And it's only a matter of time before the Christian community here or so forth begins. I mean, I have a lot of Christian friends who tells me, who tell me it's it's very difficult when the Israelis talk about being, quote, practical on the Temple Mount and, and in, in Jerusalem and not asserting the rights, because if the Jews aren't able to assert their rights in Jerusalem, then the Christian world feels, what, what position are they in? Israel right now is the custodian for the entire West of Western interests in Jerusalem, and it isn't willing to assume the role that role. Um, now you can say, well, why should little Israel assume the role for the world? Well, because it's a Jewish issue. And the Jews have, if, if we're not willing to stand for our own rights in the middle of Jerusalem, then it's a hole in the middle of our soul. And, and it raises very serious questions about our longevity if we're not willing to do that. That's precisely why Jerusalem's an issue for the Palestinians and for the, for, for, for the radical Muslims right now, because they know it's not that it's important to them, it's because it's important to us. And if they, if they, if they see us willing to be ginger about it or delicate or afraid to assert our rights, let alone surrender our rights, and this includes also the Europeans giving up, you know, forcing Israel with, with Jerusalem and the consulate. This is a signal the West has no soul in their currency, creates an image of weakness, invites war, and, and, and prolongs the, the, the belief that Israel is not long for this world and the West is not long for this world. It, it essentially feeds the most radical narrative in the Muslim world. So Jerusalem, the issue of Jerusalem, is not because it's important to them. It's because it's important to us. And if we don't make that point that it's important to us, we're done. Yeah. Well, I think you're right, and I think that I and I think that unfortunately or fortunately, I um, you know, it it it's it's indivisible. At the end of the day, if you give up one thing, you give up the other thing. If you think that this isn't important, then that isn't important either. And if they're not important, then nothing is important and you can give it all away. And obviously, it's not just the Jews in Israel that are suffering from this overflowing willingness to not defend things that have to be defended in order for the whole to survive, as we see in the United States as well. You know, people think that if they, it, this doesn't happen or that, it, it, you know, all right, so maybe we don't need to be able to say Merry Christmas. Maybe we don't need to have the manger in the town square. Maybe we don't need this. We can see why it would bother people. All right, we should give extra. We should give uh, more regard to other, you know, to Kwanzaa or any other holiday, Eid, that people want to support and pay less attention to Christian ones because anyway, we already are in charge, so it doesn't matter. Um, and, and on and on and on. And the, and the more that you, the further that you go, you know, the, the, now you see that the nuclear family is very much under attack by progressives, motherhood, fatherhood, uh, womanhood, uh, manhood, you know, the very humanity of human beings, their sexuality, their children, 
the education of their children, their rights, all of these things, the home itself are under attack by the progressives. And so people give a little and then they're stuck and they find that they're giving away everything. And then and then the question is, is it ever too late or is it always possible to get things back? And I think that, you know, we talked about a number of trends here. We talked about environmentalism as a way to destroy Western economies. And we've talked about you know, the radicalization of the of, of education system as a means to undermine the humanity of individuals. And we talk about anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism as a way to do all of these things in Israel. And I think it all begins with, um, you know, what we've been taught, which is to avoid <clears throat> confrontations, is to, is to seek peace, is to try to have domestic tranquility. And if all sides agree to that and all sides agree to the to the rules, then it works. And when one side of the agreement doesn't agree to follow the rules, then nothing works. And um, and then it just becomes a question of will the battle be joined by the other side? Will they be willing to put you know, their ease and their comfort on the side and, and say, OK, we, we'd have to fight this war and we have to win it. We can't come home until it's done. Or not, because if they don't, if we don't, then we're going to lose everything. Well, it's exactly what you, you know, the, again, going back to the issue of the progressives, they are at war with the West. And, you know, when you strip everything away, the West began at Mount Moriah. So the issue of Jerusalem and the issue of Israel and it is, is a foundational uh, structure for the West. It, it, without it, the West doesn't exist. So that is ultimately the focal point for the progressives, which is why they're obsessed with the Palestinians and Jerusalem and the Muslim Brotherhood. That That is why they know the West ultimately. But if you say that, but, it, but wait a minute, by the same token, if you say that, then why would, conser- why would conservatives, why would cr- Christian evangelicals ever give up on Israel? Because if this is, if this is the, you know, if this is the keystone of the war, if this is the thing that's going to determine the course of humanity, then just as Israelis should be required to stand up and fight for our rights to to Jerusalem and to fight for our rights. No, I don't think they can give people. up on Israel. No, they but can, I'm saying that, that, that the Republicans, the Republicans and the evangelicals have to stand up with us, even if they see that we don't want to, don't they? Yeah, but they can get increasingly angry and frustrated and alienated from from the behavior of of Israel if if Israel doesn't see that its own role here is is I mean it's at the end of the day it's Jewish civilization that is most anchored to uh, to to Mount Moriah and it's a Christian civilization that emanated from Jewish civilization so yes I mean they 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 have no choice their backs against the wall. But it's a devastating defeat if they don't have a Jewish alliance in this and a frustration will follow. So but but again, it goes one has to understand the Palestinian issue, the Jerusalem issue in terms of this war against the West and to destroy the West on the progressive side. So Israel can do what it wants to try to calm the situation. They, The other side has no incentive, no strategic reason to ever reconcile to Israel's calm presence there. It will eternally wage a war on Israel's presence there. Uh, so it's, and, and the West has no choice but to defend its very essence by making a stand on Jerusalem. So you're right, the Christians have no choice if they remember who they are as well. Too many Christians are forgetting that as well. So, well, we'll have to see. I mean, I I think that there are certainly uh, the, the other problem, and I guess we can just end with that is that what we saw with the the uh, elections, and like you were saying, this really is a shift in the United States that's been going on since 2016, and in Israel, it's been going. I would argue that it's been going on in the United States since before that. I mean, it just it it rose to a well to to sort of a, a clear majority in 2016 after eight years of, of Obama. But the backlash against Obama began at the very outset of his presidency because it was so radical and so quick. But in Israel as well, you know, the backlash from the failure of the Oslo process and Palestinian terror campaign one after the other has been a, a solid majority of Israelis who support 
the right who support uh, strong uh, security policies, who's you know, and, and and want them and want to make sure that the Knesset is is able to fulfill the will of the people. Um, and and what we're seeing though is that despite that, you have these regulatory states, you have these. Um, that that are tying up democratic processes, subverting the will of the people, uh, at, not only by stealing elections or by undermining the the results of the elections after the ballots have already been cast uh, in various ways and through lawfare and through bureaucratic fare and all the rest of it, regulation, overregulation, prejudicial regulation to harm uh, the civil rights of of Democrats it, with a small d, um, you know, we're, we're facing a problem where even when we hold the majority, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be in charge. Exactly. Exactly. Which is, uh, again, the determination to really understand this and what the progressive assault is has to be there. One has to match their determination and fight them on their terms. Uh, uh, Point by point, it's a real battle here. This is not a political parlor game anymore. No, it's not. I mean, so I I do think that, you know, we're we are going to have to figure out new ways to fight old battles because we're they're actually not that old. They're new. And what we're facing today in Israel and in the United States and in other free countries around the world are systems that are geared toward blocking us from being able to determine our fates. And we have to figure out how to fight them at the same time as we win elections and at the same time that we're will, able to having won elections take power and then having taken power, use the power that we just earned in the ballots in order to push the positions that the people elect their leaders to advance. I mean, it's it's all very difficult, but it's all very necessary. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess on that happy note, is there anything else that our that our viewers and our listeners should think about as we go forward into the next week with the uh, with a with a Democrat in New Jersey, just barely, and a Republican, uh, very well situated to take hold in in Virginia, and and uh, so on and so forth. Any any words, fi- pi- parting words of wisdom as we move? No, forward? I just think uh, it's it's a very serious affair. I mean, this is this is Western civilization on the line. We really have to get serious about this now. We've lost our youth. We 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 were we were not uh, attentive to the loss of our universities, our cultural institutions, our schools. Uh, this is uh, every contact now will be a battleground, and, uh, and we have to be very serious about this. And our foundation as a Judeo-Christian culture here in the United States and a Jewish culture in Israel, one cannot be apologetic about it. It has to be asserted now. This is it. So, well, I agree. You know, it's always, you know, it's always my view that there's no reason to be on defense if you can be on offense. So, yeah, we just have to go on out and attack, attack, attack until we finally beat them down. That's what I say. And if you want more information, you're going to have to tune in next week for another episode of the Carolyn Glick Middle East News Hour. We thank you very much again. Remember to subscribe, to subscribe your friends, to, sub- to subscribe your children, your grandchildren, your grandparents, your parents your nodding acquaintances, your neighbors, your enemies. Subscribe everybody to the Carolyn Glick Middle East News Hour on YouTube, on Rumble, on all kinds of, uh, of uh, podcast systems, uh, probably every single one. And uh, thank you again, David, for joining me. Again, thank you. great. And we will we will meet again shortly. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. 